Good morning and welcome back to another episode of Live here on Keystroke Medium. I am Josh Hayes here with Chuck Manley and Scott Moon. We're all drinking coffee today of on this fine Monday, Monday morning. Uh, welcome. Between right and wrong. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so if we weren't drinking coffee, then we'd be it wrong. It would be a sign of the end time. <laughs> Look at those decadent bastards not drinking coffee. What the hell is wrong with that? Uh, speaking of not being wrong, Lauren Moore is the first um, yeah, comment today on the show, so she gets the keystroke medium golf clap of appreciation. Thank you, Lauren, and welcome everybody else in the live chat. It's taking a little bit of time for people to stream in today, so um, while we're rambling, uh, you know, you're welcome. One says, "I'm not late." Lose, I'm not. Lose here. I'm not late. That's right. I'm, I'm late. not late. <laughs> 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 we should just put that on, like. The uh, the scrolling thing. If you're not late, just say it. It's, yeah, uh, we love when people I, we are should, on time. Make a great, great T-shirt to wear to work. I'm, I'm not, not late. late. I'm not late. I'm uh, here. Or, or better yet, name your kid that. <laughs> that I'm yeah, not late, I'm not late. <laughs> here. <laughs> and also, uh, not Lou, late. welcome to the show, and everybody listening on the audio stream. If you didn't know, this show live is actually broadcast live every Monday. Uh, for now, until we change it because that's what we like to do. Um, and uh, you should come hang out because the live shenanigans are where it's at. And if you're just finding our YouTube channel today, you should hit the subscribe button and hit the little bell. Ding! Uh, it goes, uh, it, it'll let you know when we go live so you can not miss a live show. And um, yeah, and that's where it's at. Hey, John. Well, from across the... Hey, John, from across the pond. Evans. From across the pond. Um, we're going to have a random show today, a rando show, uh, talking about whatever we wanted, um, because that's what we do here on Keystroke when we have, uh, random is tight. We <laughs> random whoopsie. whoopsie. Um, <laughs> that in no way means we just didn't bother planning a show. That's right. No, we did. Uh, so this we, we were professional and intentional for your entertainment. Always. So we were going to have uh, Devin C. Ford on the show, and we uh, we were going to talk about our new collaborative series, Tranquility, and Scott and Chuck were going to basically MC the interview. Yeah. Uh, but then that he had... Uh, Devin instead. Then he bailed on us. We, we should just talk about he it. Just like, just, like, like, just bash on him the whole I mean, time he just, he's he not here. He said, like, screw you guys. I don't want to... Basically just gave us the finger. And, he did. And, he really did. Yeah. Thanks. It's more classy when a British person gives you the. Thing. It really is. They have yeah. And it sounds so much more villainous too. You I know? don't. I, I you know. So I I I I regret our Skype conversations about story because when I can do it, like if we do it on the phone where it's audio, I can picture him with a monocle and a top hat and a little curly mustache, <laughs> yeah. and he's like, "Oh, we're gonna do the plot." This I don't. I can't do an English accent. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> But yeah. then when I see him in person on the video, I'm like, that's you completely just ruined my entire <laughs> image of you as a person. He's got like uh, 400 so Viking about tattoos. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, hopefully maybe next weekend we can get him on the show um, and and have a good good show. This show is going to be good regardless. Uh, it's going to be kind of an AMA show, kind of a, a whatever roundtable show. If you have anything in the in the comments, anything that you had weighing on your writing career this week, or any thoughts or questions you have, uh, light them up in the live chat, and we'll uh, get to them. Um, life, work issues, just whatever true. you got, throw it out there. True. We will advise. This is the weekly weekly KSM couch. Um, Psych is it psychological or psych psych psychiatric? psychiatric is I can I always mix up like what are the two? Like which one? So the, biggest, the biggest difference is psychiatry. You have to go to medical school for, and you, you can prescribe drugs. If you're a psychologist, you have to work with a psychiatrist in order to subscribe or to prescribe drugs. So the psychiatrist is the one you want to be. Psychiatry, yeah. If you want to be a medical doctor and and specialize in like 
behavioral stuff and a psychiatrist is where you want to be. But as far as the counseling aspect of things go, they're kind of the same. I got you. I probably should know that because my dad's one of the two. I think he's the psychologist, not the psychiatric doctor. He he doesn't prescribe medication. Yeah, he's a psychologist. He just talks to people all the time. He he nods. This is how I picture my dad in the office, like just saying, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh-huh. You want to go get lunch later? Like, just uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about yeah. your feelings. Hold on a second. That sucks. <laughs> Boom Beach. Yeah. He's good. playing. He's tell playing. Me, candy tell me about crush. your feelings. <laughs> you know what? I, I actually mentioned uh, to my son one time that I had considered becoming a psychologist counselor uh, a while back, and uh, he laughed just like that. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you not? Are you not good at dad, listening to people, Dad? You just need to get a plaque for your desk that says "Shut up and get over it." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. I don't do. I even when my kids, my kids come up like crying with legitimate problems, just like stop crying, stop yeah, it. That's not going to solve anything. Suck it up. Um, talking about kids crying. What if your guys? What have you guys been doing in your riding lives this week? Um, I got sunburn on a boat. And wrote about two chapters in the uh, Tranquility Project, and that was fun. Uh, but man, I'm I'm recovering today. Like this, I I was like, let's get a boat and have fun on the weekends. And I didn't really take into account that, like, after you've been on the lake for eight hours, you need like eight days to recover. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. Um, what about you, Scott? What's this pre-order thing you got going on on your? Like, let's let's do uh, let's do some hobbies that involve extreme uh, <laughs> physical labor. <laughs> Yes, let's um, do that. <laughs> so I, I, this morning I put uh, I put Victory Days, the third book in the that came for Blood and Alien Invasion series, up on pre order, nice. which is always always dangerous. The second one is is on pre order also. It's going to come out um, July eighteenth. I went ahead and put up the third one since I had the book cover, and I'm working on it now. And I got the book description the way I like it. I put it up for the middle of September. So I kind of want to keep on a consistent schedule. I don't really want to do super rapid release, but I think for this particular series, every couple of months is probably pretty solid. Keep it nice. going. Yeah. And I love the book covers. That's the main thing. It's like, I got to show people the covers. <laughs> they must be out. <laughs> book two is like, so I like book one, but book two really like kicks it up a notch. Book two is uh, in, on the cover. In cover. Cause it almost looks like a, um, like he's in some kind of, like exos like it's funny. i don't know like armored suit or something and he's doing vicious battle with a alien predator klingon person yeah ab- absolutely so and that's that it brings up a funny point so when i get these covers it almost all like i'll get them if i get them in time they change the story <laughs> yes because i think that's so cool and i was like i'm looking at that that i'm looking for a picture so we can, i can do a screen share of oh here i got player. it pulled up right now okay because I, I have uh Book three, I can show that. I can do it. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, whatever. I mean, you have the art for it, but uh, but anyway, yeah, if you want to show that. So basically, do I have it in Messenger? Probably. I'll check. I'll check. Continue your your description. Um, But anyway, so like in in, in the book, book two, uh, Resistance Day, you know, he's got this armor, he's facing this alien, he's got an axe, kind of a cool axe. And I described it as had the bad guy facing an alien and gave him a bunch of comps. And kind of kicked him back and forth and give him like a fireman's axe or something instead of a gun this time. And so he does this really cool axe, but it's obviously more of a sci-fi axe. It has like little power outlets on it or something. And so in the story, I'm like, well, he's going to have to have an axe. And so obviously, <laughs> that into the plot. Obviously. Like that. But that happened a lot with Reaper. That happened a, a lot with like the Reaper mask is a big part of the plot. It's in It's featured in four or five of the ten reaper books well the reaper mask was something that was on the book card i was like oh and I, I was still working on the book i'm like ah he's gonna have a reaper mask what does the reaper mask do i don't know well this could change the story blah blah blah, blah. and so they will it doesn't definitely matter what the mask does just do it yeah. <laughs> a, a good book cover will inspire me to change the story and usually for the better that's that's I, the I, I think i'm going to try to put these in order i've got them all up on my screen now i've got the second third and fourth one Okay. So the second one is the dude with the axe. Is the right. third one with the gun over his shoulder? The third one is the gun over shoulder and the and the girl, the blonde girl facing the viewpoint. And do you want me to do the one, the other one, the one where they're walking towards the spaceship or no? 
Yeah, go ahead. Why not? Since it's just, you, man. this is a keystroke medium uh, exclusive, I haven't shown this to anybody else. I like exclusives. Hold exclusives. on. Exclusives. Yeah. Put them on the. Dun. I got to put them on the other, the other monitor, so I don't show you guys all my secrets. Uh, let's we, see. We don't want to see your browser history. <laughs> yeah, oh, God. Let's talk about sex, baby. Oh. Uh, let's see. So this one here is book two. So right. Make that a little bigger. Uh, that's and kind of cool. Book yeah. Three. I don't like the way it came. Anyway. And and book four. Those yeah. are really like I I love that the uh, powered suit, dude. I think that's yeah. awesome. I like that it's kind of sleek and you know not yeah. big and yeah. chunky. It's good, you know, and it's interesting to see how artists take your briefs and make them into stuff. And they're they're very close to what what I had, but kind of better and kind of different. But so the, the second book in the series is Resistance Day. It's kind of like in the first book, Invasion Day, Earth gets conquered and everybody gets put under these alien overlords and they get their asses kicked and everybody's wiped out. And then in book two, they rally and they're starting to fight back. And he's got that cool axe. And then in book three, it's Victory Day. And then in book four, they're starting a process of reverse engineering. And they're going to go either back to, I haven't decided yet, back to where the, the aliens came from or on to someplace else or to a new and more dangerous alien threat. And then book five, if I do a book five, will be like arriving probably nice. at at the at where the, the Fosca came from. How much of a how much of a time frame difference is there between book one and book two? Like because uh, I've obviously I think most of us have thought about the whole alien invasion thing at some point and I always thought there would have to be a pretty big gap for humans to sort of regroup and reorganize yeah. enough to, to really fight back. Between the first book and the second book, you know, you're talking weeks or months and, and, and kind of the same between the second and third. So the transition between book three and book four is going to be longer, obviously, because they're reverse engineering stuff. Sure. Although I did, I did come up with something about in book three that is interesting that maybe and, and throughout the series, <clears throat> there's some hints that this the game that one of the characters works for Warfighter Games, and he's he's a game designer, and he's realizes pretty early in book one that his employers knew more about this invasion than seems reasonable because they're pretty well prepared, and so that that so what I'm saying is is there maybe or maybe not no total spoilers, be a chance that Earth somebody on Earth some Earth government or corporation has started to develop some space travel. And so they have a little bit of a, a so it'd be less unreasonable that they can suddenly, you know, I mean, they already right. kind of have some furniture yeah. building, yeah. but you don't know about that yet. So don't tell anybody and forget about it. If you start reading the books until later when I reveal it, <laughs> <laughs> but, if, nice. yeah, but of course the, the earth ship will be a weird when the, once they start reverse engineering the technology, they're going to have the, what they started with kind of like, this is what we thought we could do. And this is all the shit. This is opened up to us now. And what kind of weird? So it'll be different than that. The, the reverse engineered technology will then be same but different. You know, maybe better even, or, or worse, depending on what we as humans do to their technology. So basically, Elon Musk is going to save everything because he's got his own special little tech. Or, or, or I could have have them trying to do that, and then that, that gets wiped out or something. Depends on whether we like that character or not. <laughs> I say kill them all. Yeah, wipe them out, wipe them out. Well, it, could be a comp it could be a competition between the two factions, you know, who wants to use our tech solely, who wants to use, use that tech and those types types of things like trying that. And then the government trying to take it away from him. The aliens themselves have two modes of travel, and part of the conflict in this series is, is that they've been traveling the slow road. And to do that, they have to basically have these weird cryoviruses that cause them to need to drink blood. That's why they came for blood is because by the time they get where they're going, they're kind of like thirsty. You know, they're kind of deficient and uh, all this stuff. Yes. And so they don't really have to have blood like a vampire, but they kind of had this weird culture and there's some physiological changes and all these things. So they, so they, they kind of go crazy. And some it's of them literally the worst of environment imaginable. Yeah. But some of them don't want to go slow. They want to go fast. And there's this main character dust is her name because she's from dust Varia, um, who is a navigator. And so she can, she can take them the fast way. But there's limitations and problems, and of course, everybody wants to get her, and there's lots of killing and running around, and scariest environment imaginable. Scar That's all you had to say is because scary, scariest yeah. environment imaginable. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of spoilers there. Enjoy.
Uh, Unity one five one says loads of death. Loads of death. Loads of loads death. Of death. Yep. What about you, Chuck? Man, what have you been up to, dude? Nothing. Uh, <laughs> That's the no. show, folks. Roll them. <laughs> um, I'm still plugging away on Jack Dark Book Two um, and all my other various and sundry projects. Uh, mostly, it's been just kid stuff. Uh, had an all-day tournament, um, softball tournament with my daughter this past Saturday, and that ate up the bulk of the weekend. And because I mean, like you said, just sitting out in the sun <laughs> and the right. eighty percent humidity and ninety whatever degrees, it was like that. You know, I was exhausting just doing that. But uh, yeah, I got some some of the older folks in my family are having some health issues, so that's my wife's actually out of town at the moment, uh, helping out with that and. Just you know, every time I turn around, it's something. But uh, I get, I get, I get my words in where I can. So this year's kind of put a damper on everybody's words. I think it's crazy. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's the curse of 2020. I think. I don't know. I think it's 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 literally because the chief ones the Chiefs won the Super Bowl this year. Well, I mean, like that, literally, that, as that, soon as the that, Chiefs that, won the Super Bowl, the entire world went to shit. We were like, we should have, we should have saw that coming. We really should have. Yeah. Really? Okay. So Maybe they if they win it next year too, it will like, like reset. do like a global reset. Yeah. And then next well, year will be way that's better. Assuming there is a, a Super Bowl next year. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It'll be, it'll be, it'll be a, a gaming Super Bowl. So it'll be like just like the Super Bowl, but instead of having real people, you have people playing. Video games of the people be like Madden. They just play. <laughs> like they're playing Madden. Madden. Everybody oh, plays their own character. Play their own character. Their own avatars on yep. Madden. Yeah. All that Super Bowl. Imagine how how you know. So that that really opens it up to lots of people like me who have no physical ability to be an NFL, but I can be in the NFL now because it's all online. True. And no Corona. <laughs> and no Corona. No Corona. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I actually got some pretty good writing done last week, uh, finished a couple chapters in our, in our series, uh, in our new, um, project, Devin and I, and, uh, he took a look at it and he was like, this is crap. We're going to have to rewrite everything. It was so bad. He refused to come on. The show. Yeah. He was like, this is horrible and we're not working together. Uh, so that was fun, and we talked about some ideas for the the follow on books, and that was fun. Uh, I started listening to the core uh, this week. I've been getting a lot uh, a lot more into audiobooks where I was uh, kind of the beginning of last year listening to a crap ton of audiobooks, and so I'm doing that again. Uh, I just finished uh, the First Law uh, trilogy a couple of weeks ago, um, and so I started the core, which is the fifth book in Peter V. Brett's, uh, demon, uh, cycle series. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because the first law trilogy, I don't know if we talked about this last week or not. I can't remember, but I, I we finished the, the first law and I, I didn't feel any, uh, oh, hi, Sean. My son's watching. Uh, I didn't feel like any big series, arc that was like earth shattering like like w the point of the whole trilogy was i don't know uh but in this then in a core you can obviously tell what the big series uh, uh through arc is and uh i don't know why it's taken me so long to finish the series because every time i get into a book i remember how well the book is put together and how well um the dialogue plays through and and even the different povs kind of have a different narrative style um, because you have a very kind of on one hand you have a very kind of uh backwoods ish um rural uh very abbreviated language that's not beautiful at all it's just very um utilitarian and then on the other side, you have the Krasians, which are kind of a mix between like a Muslim and um, uh, like Arabic type uh, civilization. And they have a very rigid uh, form of address and form of communication and titles. And it's all very formal. And 
um, but it's also very brutal at the same time. And so you kind of, it's like, it's like really neat going back and forth between the two um, narrative and dialogue structures. And one of the interesting things I think he does with the series is with the Krasians and their, their very religious um, uh, kind of warrior um, people. And where I think a lot of people get hemmed up uh, in world building is explaining all of the different things that they do and explaining the titles and all that in actual like standard English or whatever language they're writing the book in. Uh, but he doesn't do that. You, you like, I literally struggled for two books to figure out what titles meant because the titles are very, like, they're not, yeah. they're not real titles. They're made up. Right. So he has like a, a, uh, showroom which, team, which, which, which Peter V. Red series are we talking about? It's the here? demon cycle. Yeah. I think I've read the first one. I'm good looking at the it. Man, yeah, it's it's the man or the painted man, depending on which version you read. Okay, but like, yeah. oh, like they have a, a title that is a, a, a Sharum is a warrior, but they have a Sharum Ting, which is a female warrior, or they have a um, Sharum Ting Pa, which is a female warrior teacher. And so like, but he never explains any of what the titles actually mean, like translated into English. And so when you're in the POV, like uh, the second book, I think is the desert spear. And for yeah. almost half of that book, you're in the Krasian, um, uh, civilization. And they're, they're using all these titles in common speak and you have no idea what they're saying half the time. You're like trying yeah. to figure out. I'm like, I don't know what they're saying, but it's really cool. Um, and, but I think that that kind of sets the series apart because he doesn't he doesn't stop and go. This is a warrior female teacher. You just have to get it through context. And uh, I, I like that a lot. And now that I'm on the fifth book of the series and if I've listened to these um, titles and these um, um, rituals in their language, I'm picking it up, which is interesting to me because I'm picking up what they're saying, even though they're not saying English. And I think that's really cool. Um, even though the book is very like this last book, like he's not squeamish at all. And I'm not either, um, but there's a lot of sex. Um, and uh, some of it just seems like just thrown in there. Like it's fortuitous. Like the warded man is the first book. Maybe that's the, the one. I, if it's the book I'm thinking about, I kind of remember it feeling. I, yeah. I, I didn't pursue it because I felt like it was going in kind of a kind of a grim dark direction. You know, it's, it's very a, grim dark. It's super yeah, grim dark. I'm yeah. not a big fan of that. So I yeah. remember it was. I did. It wasn't my favorite. I remember kind of having to really work at it. It didn't just like suck me in. I, I was very conscious that I was reading during the whole thing. Of it, but I'm curious now. So maybe I'll maybe I because I that's one of the few books I've read in a paperback. So maybe I should listen to it. It's oh. very grim, dark. Like the characters when you talk about like like Sanderson's take a shot thing about putting characters <laughs> in trees and then setting the trees on fire. Like this guy puts them in trees, sets the trees on fire, and then turns the entire ground around them to lava. And like, <laughs> and you're like, oh my god. Um, so so yeah. the whole series should be titled Yeah, They're Fucked. Yeah, they're screwed the whole time. Uh, so I, you know, it's it is definitely it is definitely something that you've got to be prepared for, um, and you've got to kind of be in the mood for because you, uh, it's not it's not happy for the most. There are really cool things that happen, and I think that one of the things that um, got was a rough start for me is it started out like the first wheel of time book or even like the, the, um, the fellowship of the rings Our where it's a, a younger character, like going on a journey. And I really wasn't, I didn't want a hero's journey. I didn't want that type of story because it starts out. The warded man starts out actually when he's a kid. Uh, and so you, you, this series literally goes from when this guy is a, uh, a little kid to a man. Um, and there's a lot of time jumping obviously, but, um, I, I didn't know that I, I did really want that kind of a book. So it took me a little bit to get into it, but once I got into it and once, uh, he became a man and, and grew up, uh, yeah, it that. became way more interesting. So I do, I do remember that. I'm going to listen to an audio book. So by comparison, in, on a scale of grimdark one to 10, one being yep. whatever you want it to be. I don't even know. You make this scale. 
<laughs> which uh, how do you, how does that compare to the first law series because it's has some super graphic and the characters and the in, in like even your protagonists are not good people a lot of times i mean they do good things and sometimes they're good but a lot of times you're like yeah probably you know they they're bad so um, Most of the i would say that in overall tone, I think the demon cycle is way more grim dark than the first law. I might get hate for that. Um, but and when I mean that, I mean it's like it's a lot more heavy, it's darker. Um as far as tone and as setting. far as overall tone and setting and what like yeah, because uh I mean the first law trilogy, like Glocked is super brutal. And every time you read him, like you you read him and you're like in pain because he's in pain, but he's also brutal for brutal sake and, and he's very good at yeah, it. He just doesn't care. Um, but the other characters, anything. like like Logan Nine Fingers, he's a killer, right? But he's also not it's not completely like you're not grim when you're with him. He doesn't like being a killer. He's a really nice guy and or yeah. not a nice guy, but but he's kind of like kind of a, a good protagonist you yeah know, until but once he goes once he becomes the bloody nine then he does shit right but those are very fall. small sections of of yeah. his story and even pharaoh uh pharaoh just hates everybody and yeah, i, I like, like i, I like reading character. yeah and and you're like yeah she's a nice character in the demon cycle like you want to care for these characters you want to see what happens to them um, but like Leisha, one of the main characters in the story is like ridiculously brutalized in the first book like just over and over and over again and not only physically but also by her mom who is just emotionally brutalizing her all the time and like so every chapter you read it you're like getting gut punched every time because you're like holy crap like what is the worst that could happen to this girl and you're like well it, it it's gonna just keep getting worse and so like jim says it sneaks up on you it does movie. sneak like, up I on you it's it's but it, i mean like i said it's brutal and it's grim dark um uh i think the characters uh in the demon cycle specifically i think all the characters are really well done and in comparison to the first law trilogy the only character i really liked was glockta like everybody else like it could have it could have been anybody but I, I thought that Glockta really stood out. And what was what was the major major West? I kind of wanted him to. Yeah, he, get, he he never really got truly heroic, but he he suffered a lot, and he was probably yeah. one of the few characters that was trying to be a good person the whole time until you realize kind of how he was as a big brother growing, you know, and that he was yeah. pretty abusive. But he was really trying to do the right thing and suffered for it all the constantly. Yeah. Yep. Uh, let's see. Hey, James McCormick's in the chat. What's up, dude? Oh, he says I'm correct. Look at this. We're going to highlight this. Uh, Josh is correct. We're just going to leave that up the whole show, probably. <laughs> Next on your key, uh, Keystroke Medium t-shirts will be the Josh is Josh correct. Josh is correct. That's true. God, Josh is correct of Doom. That so, it's Josh interesting is high fantasy because um, I guess it was last week I actually posted looking for some recommendations for High fantasy that yep. wasn't really grim dark. Yep. Also wasn't choked with flowery prose and 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 excessive world building. And as I as I put that post up and uh, people started responding to it, I kind of realized that I was looking for a sort of throwback experience to 80s type fantasy like the Dragonlance Chronicles and yep. stuff like that. Yep. And I, that, that to me kind of brought up the qu question of what do you guys think is the biggest difference between fantasy from 30 years ago and fantasy today? What, Before what, we get to that, Josh needs to change the runner because it says that Scott is always correct. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> All right, maybe, we'll put it up there maybe, for maybe just that was, a second. Maybe that was the main Fantasy 30 years ago, the difference is, is Scott was always correct. Yeah. And, he's like, and speaking of magic and magic system, so I have I bought this Yeti and I'm going all over the fucking place. Sorry. I bought this Yeti, right? And, and with this, I bought this this chug lid so I can drink out of it. And speaking of magic, so Ooh, can you believe uh, that? That blew my mind. I did that by accident, pulling out and I was like, 
Hey. What is this magic? So I don't lose the lid. So I think um, that was so it, it really depends on it really depends on what fantasy you read because I've read some new fantasy that um I I liked um but it, it could have been better. Um uh I started reading what was that book we started reading, Scott, last year? The Priory uh, of the Orange Tree. Priory of the Orange Tree. Like that was pretty decent. I didn't get very far into it because I like even some of the characters were really good. I just didn't for some reason I was not compelled to continue reading. It was very yeah, weird. Yeah. I spent it, like 60 bucks on that book, so I probably better better buy it. How about the it, big it, giant? Yeah, so did I. And it was okay. I think a lot of it was that it, it jumped really quick between the characters and it was really yeah, that one. I've got the same thing. Beautiful cover, by the way. Yeah. Uh, I literally the, bought the sports cover. Oh, and the, that. and the, the prowls the pros, the prowls. The pros is really good. Um, but the style of jumping back and forth between the characters super fast, sometimes it was really hard for me to establish an identity for the characters. Yeah. And so I didn't feel compelled for really to read any of them like um in demon cycle and first law even in game of thrones though those chapters are three or four thousand words a piece and so you sometimes really get more. a yeah. sometimes more and you really get a handle on that people. character and who they are um and in this book it seemed like she was just trying to introduce as many characters as possible or just trying to really pull you into each character as quickly as possible um, and so you didn't get really a, a good sense of the character. So I don't know. Um, I started reading, what was the other book that I started reading uh, and then and didn't get very far into it because I didn't like, uh, I didn't, it was kind of the same thing where I was like, okay, here's another uh, hero's journey with a young male character who's got to learn about the, oh, The Shadow of What Was Lost by James Is. I heard that one came up in my uh, inquiry. So I started listening to it. The Shadow of What Was Lost by James Islington. And it's got a nice cover. Michael Kramer reads it. Who's Michael Kramer's very uh very good narrator. Um, and it it was basically like one of those stories that starts out with a um a boy who is is trying to learn the magic, but for some reason he can't do it as well as the other people can um, but then it turns out he's not actually this type of magic person he's this type of magic person and no one put it together until the book starts even though it's very readily apparent that everybody knows that there's a different type of magic user and these people like uh, killed these people and there was like a big war and it's it should have been readily apparent to every really knowledgeable magic person in the world that this kid was not this it was this uh, right. and it wasn't and so it to me it felt like kind of a a, a con for uh the reader to try to get them into this thing and and i oh i just didn't feel it i i didn't feel it at all i i, I and and it was like he's the lone survivor of this massacre where they go through and they kill all these people but it, it to me it felt really like random and i i don't know i didn't get into it very well uh that's when yeah. i started the demon cycle um I'm trying to think of obviously uh i've told you forever to read storm stormlight and that is not grimdark um but it is it, it's that's big all, uh, what uh james is asking is he says what is this book and who is she is that is that, is that what we're talking about the the priory or oh yeah um she is samantha shannon yeah, sorry. Samantha Shannon, The Priory of the Orange Tree. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if it's a series or not. Uh, I just know right now it's one book. Um, maybe I'll get back into it. Maybe if I listen to it on audio, it'll be a little better. But uh, uh, Stormlight, that's that's Take a Shot Sanderson, right? That's Take a Shot Sanderson, yes. So Stormlight okay. is... Uh, is that the name of the series or the book? The book is called The Way of Kings. It's the first book in the Stormlight Archives. Um, there's three right now. I think there's ten planned and four is coming out in November. Um, okay. I, I well, heard that uh, Sanderson's working title, uh, take a shot for, for Stormlight was actually, I'm writing this for Josh. That was that's his working the, title. That's definitely his working title. Yes. Well, I ended up picking up Web of Eyes, uh, by some oh, yeah. named Danny Castle. Hmm. Uh, Shady uh, character. I hear, yeah. Yeah. I, I hear I that Jamie gonna, guy's a weird dude. I, uh, I heard he's got a beard. Just like, yeah. 
it's kind of sketchy. You know, I just I wonder about it. But um, are you reading to it or are you listening to it? I'm actually reading it because I listened to the sample and Daniels did something weird with Whitney's voice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, they got a and lot I of hate for that. Talked to uh, Steve about that, and he's like, "Yeah, he jacked it up." <laughs> yeah, he said it's better further on. I'm like, "Well, maybe I'll read the first couple and then listen to it later." Is that the one I, where, I, that I, one where I, he was reading and he was like, the character was drunk and and he read it so so you could barely understand a word he was saying because he like actually very good. Uh, I'm pretty sure that they had him re-record the beginning, like some of the know, beginning of that. Yeah. First couple of chapters i think is what steve said uh lou's asking haven't read that one it's like 50 to 60 hours long you're talking about um the bird goddess or stormlight i'm not sure which one you're talking about lou both are pretty long so uh Berry goddess uh that saga is done though i think the all six books are done and out on audio i yeah. think now they're like they're i think they're like and they're like super 200 thousand words a piece or something like that or 230 yeah. or something crazy long yep uh stormlight lou says it's long. Uh, yes. Oh, Stormlight! Stormlight's uh, ridiculously long. I think it's like uh, forty-eight hours on audiobook or something. Uh, um, the each book, I think, like the first book, I think is like three hundred and eighty thousand words. Book two is like four hundred something thousand words. I mean, they're all plus two fifty, like easy plus two fifty. And and it's interesting because when you read, like, huh? Yeah, the Stormlight books are there. There are three out now. Four, which is called the Rhythm of War, is coming out in November, and then there's ten planned. When you say the Rhythm of War, I think of that Scorpion song. I just keep that. But honestly, like it, when I first read Stormlight or The Way of Kings, rather, it took me like five times to get into it um, because it was just yeah, so. It took me several times to get it started. Yeah, it was super dense, and the learning curve is high, like super high. Um, <laughs> but once you get into it like once you get past like the learning curve aspect of it and you just read like you like the learning curve is odd because there's three there's basically three prologues in the book so there's one prologue that's fourth uh 4500 years ago there's another prologue that's like 50 years ago or something and then there's another basically prologue that is like a year ago or something like that and then the book has a chapter one um and all three prologues are done by different povs they're all presented differently with kind of a different narrative style and then uh the book starts and like it never touches the first prologue again like ever it never goes back to that well and you talk about it and as the characters talk about the past events you go back and read it and you go okay i can see that um, so in and, as a writer was it necessary or should you have cut it because i know and understand the breadth of what he's doing with stormlight it's absolutely necessary okay, okay so you um, think an unknown name could get away with that and probably people not, actually no. read absolutely it. not the the length of the books a brand new author i don't think would get away with it yeah, and like- and the fact that it's written in the cosmere and the cosmere has multiple books and multiple series in it um which you don't need to read you can read everything independently but to get the full picture of what he's doing you have to read all of them um i don't think a new author could get could get away with that either what, what's the character in way of kings the the female character does the drawing shalon on. when i've read hers I, she seemed like when i started to read and listen because i read and listen at the same time um i was like this is pretty generic fantasy character it's doing the, the, the high high magic stuff and i was not in i had a, I struggled but she wound up being my favorite character in the series shalon for some reason shalon was not actually a mary sue in the first one but you learned a lot about because she is kind of an outsider coming into this big thing and so you learn a lot about what everything means through her yeah. um uh um, she had a kind of a complicated past she is operating on a false yeah. premise because her, yeah. her family was in dire need if she didn't make this work and yada yada it's a, it's a good but it it is it is you have to do some heavy lifting to get into it but yeah like after i got into it it's my number one fantasy book of all time probably and you've read it how many times i've done the entire series three times See, I need to go into the first law thing and read it three times so I can discuss it because I had a different reaction with the first law trilogy than you did. I really liked it, but I yeah. can't explain why you're, you're saying, I don't, you ask me all these questions like, uh, yeah, I'm not articulate at all. 
So I'm gonna have to go through that again. Although I'm not sure I'm not sure I can handle some of it three times because it's so dark in places. Yeah. But. So Scott just used a a, a phrase I want to touch back on a generic character. Now we all know what that is, but do do you think that there's a certain again throwback to like the '80s stuff, the the Dragonlance and the Drist books and Eddings and all those guys? Um, isn't there a certain comfort level? to those generic characters, to the uncomplicated quest stories, to the more, now I'm not going to say like not grim because there's a lot of grim shit, especially if you read like Donaldson's Fowl's, uh, Lord Fowl books, uh, Thomas Covenant books, uh, you know, it gets pretty grim, but there's that sense of hope that comes with them that seems mu harder and harder to find in the newer. Well, kind of if you change the character common, the common character types, they're common because it's something that appeals to readers for whatever reason, you know, we're all kind of maybe the journey or whatever, or, and, and so I, I think that they continue to reach people because the basic premise has, but you need to, sometimes it, are you doing that or are you just basically recycling the character that, you know, cause like, like, uh, uh, the Wheel of Time, when you start reading it especially, it just feels like basically a straight-up rip-off of Tolkien. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, they're going to go on a journey. They don't know anything. They're simple people from a village and blah, blah, blah. And a lot of fantasy was kind of like that. And it's just not very – putting a unique spin on it was not always done so much. And then people – the problem I have with a lot of epic – fantasy from 20 or 30 years ago is that then they tried to make it different. And that's one of my main problems I have with Sanderson. So that's why Josh and I aren't doing this episode in the same room. So you can't like try to choke <laughs> me out. <laughs> is that it's, I, I find it too magic heavy in the explanations and the magic rules and a lot of fantasy. I remember reading in the eighties and nineties, you know, maybe early two thousands was like, it was so much about the magic and I just became fatigued with trying to figure out the magic system. And so when I first read Game of Thrones, which I read on accident because it's the only like get on a free library library audiobook, I was blown away because I was like, oh, we can get right to the characters and what's what's the, they're they're in danger and the prayer, peril and these they got to make these choices that are impossible, and it's like yeah, there's magic and it's very intriguing, but I'm not like having to like go to like do you feel like I'm doing homework. Yeah, you're not getting. Like, for them to cast a fireball, they need to make these this they need to sacrifice this much of their soul to do blah blah blah, you know, and it just I f I find a lot of magic, too much magic and explanation of magic, very fatiguing and boring. I think when you, uh, you ask the character, the question about a generic character and, and, uh, I, I think that it's very, first of all, it's very easy to write a generic character. Um, uh, because you don't have to come up with a whole lot of unique things. Also, I think it's easier for readers to read a generic character in that type of a setting because, uh, they don't have to work at it. Like you can just follow along with the every man and he doesn't really character doesn't really know a lot about what's going on. So the reader doesn't have to know a lot about what's going on. So the lifting is not very in, uh, heavy in, there. Right. You can slide into it and, um, and you don't have to, to really work at it. So well, like, so that's, that's the problem with Sanderson. And I'm not going to help you for long, but that, for the very first part of it, that character is like running on the ceiling and he's some sort yeah. of other creature. And you're like, who is he? What's he doing? And you just, it's very, there's no explanation. Yeah. He's not an every man. He's something, and it's truly unique. That is good, but it's also hard to read. Well, that was one of the things about the demon cycle books that when you read like Arlen's character from the beginning, he is an every man and you learn about the magic system. You learn about the wards. You learn about everything uh, in the world through him very easily. Um, and then when you go to the Krasian character, and for some reason, I can't remember that character's name right now. It's it's I'm losing it. I think it's Chardir. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, but that reading that character is super hard because it's not an everyman character. It is a an, a very strict, extremely religious, very smart, um, violent character. Um, and when you read him, that is how you read him. And there's no generic explanations about what he's doing. And he and then and the writer does not take time to explain to the reader what this character is doing and why and what he says and and uh, he doesn't translate or anything like that. And so that unique character 
is hard to read and it's I almost didn't make it through the desert spear because it was so hard to read when you get there it's very satisfying if you can, right if you can now get. like on the fifth book love reading his stuff because i understand and i can almost read the other language because i i understand what they're talking about but in the second book when you meet him it's super hard to read because you don't understand what he's saying um and so like I think it really depends on what type of book you want to read. Like, like for instance, there's a really, there's really complicated sci-fi books. And then there's really generic Michael Bay explosion sci-fi books that you can read. And it really depends on what type of, what type of book you want. I wish that we could, I wish that we could, um, when we go on Amazon, you could say, I want to read a really complicated fantasy story. And it would give you like, so, uh, like hard, like hard character. Like I want to, I want to work to read this book, and it would put that in a category, and you could read yeah. that. Uh, lot, because like Game of Thrones, the magic system is so, really, so uh, soft and so not really present that you can read it, yeah, and you don't even really you know, have to understand that the magic's yeah, there. Because you read for a while, thinking, and you know it's magic because it's in the fantasy, but you're like, yeah, is there magic at all? Right. I mean, is there magic? Or right. do they just think, and like, because if you read like Vernon Cornwell's, like his his uh, Viking books and stuff, the, you know, the last, what is it? Anyway, but he has, there's a there's a series on it, but you're reading about Vikings and it feels like the first part of the Game of Thrones books because the, the people act like there's magic, but you know, there's not because it's right. historical fiction. Right. And so I kind of like that. And I also like the fact that in a magical world where almost nobody can use magic, all of the mag all of the rules about magic that you could learn from just going and interacting with the people in like whatever magical kingdom would all be wrong because yeah. they don't know anything about magic. All of the beliefs right. would be false. And I like that about Game of Thrones. And I like that about the first law because they say stuff like it's like this is a true thing about how magic, but you you find out that's not how it works at all. Yeah, exactly. I love that so, about those so theories. Totally, yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I like that. that. There's a lot of talk about how a lot of people uh, well, I'll say a lot of people, a couple of people. Uh, think that uh, Sanderson is actually, he writes the most sci-fi fantasy they've ever read. And a lot of that is because he gives all these explanations for how the magic works. Yeah. And then someone else mentioned the force from Star Wars, and I immediately thought of midichlorians. And I've always had a pretty hard and fast rule that you never explain the magic. The minute you start explaining it, it stops being magic. It stops being special. So how do you know about that? So it's interesting because um, like the Stormlight Archives, the Way of Kings, like it's it's it is fantasy. It's uh, it's high, uh, high fantasy with with a soft, uh, mostly soft magic system, even though it's it's developing into more of a harder magic system. But the, the core of it is still soft magic. Um, but it's basically um, a fantasy with uh, powered <coughs> space marine armor. Which one is that? Uh, the Way of Kings. Yeah. If like so, if like you could describe Game of Thrones, it would be uh, medieval ice zombies. That would be Game of Thrones, right? So Way of Kings is basically fire like fire and dragon. It's it's they have they're fighting um, space marines. Uh, they're fighting space marines in space armor and in, in powered space armor um, with swords that come out of nowhere. Um, like that's that's the. It, that's not the book, but like you could just boil it down to that, right? Conceptualize it as that. Yeah. Um, so the is a little bit magical or organic, right? Or my, I remember that wrong. What the in Stormlight? Yeah. Yeah. So the it's difference funny. with like like with with Mistborn and Mistborn is in the Cosmere, and so this where where Brandon goes very hard magic um, is in Mistborn. All the magic is based around metals, and so every metal has a different. Uh, elemental property and a different magical property and a different mental property. There's there's different there's different levels right. on how the magic works. So, um, like uh, That's I, where I they don't even they know. Throw the coin down to the metal and then they can push, basically push off. The they, coin they can and push they can and pull off metal. Um, they can fly using metal, um, but also they can use it mentally too. They basically you ingest a metal like silver, copper, gold, uh, aluminum becomes a thing. And when you when you ingest that metal, you're able to use different uh, magical properties. Um, and the, but there's three different ways to use the magic system in Mistborn. So you have Alamancy, but you also have Feral Kimmy. 
Uh, and then you have, uh, I can't remember what the third one is off the top of my head. Not everybody can use it, and some of it's toxic to some people, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, but, but in Stormlight, it, it, is, it is prevalent, and you understand where the magic comes from, but it's also very soft in that it's it's not the origins of it is not really well explained. And it's not like I can, in, like in Mistborn, you can adjust copper. You have a, a, a specific ability in, in, in Stormlight, the Stormlight archive, that that's the magic is Stormlight. You ingest Stormlight, which is called investiture. You invest Stormlight and then it gives you uh, energy. It gives you all this different stuff. So, um, and it's also what powers the, um, the powered, ar the, the armor, the the shards is what they're called. You wear a shard plate and you have a shard blade. Um, you know what they and, can do with those things. It's unlike in in Tolkien. I heard so, I've heard several people use this. That if you look at Tolkien and Lord of the Rings, you think Gandalf might be able to fly, but we don't know because mm -hmm. it's just kind of open ended. Right. But like in Stormlight, you know that the when you when you do the investiture and, and you got the stuff, you can do this much stuff basically. And and different people can use it in different ways. They have different uh, orders of knights radiant, which have different abilities. Um, so some people can. They're they're called um, uh, they win sky dance. I can't remember now. I'm losing my. Some people can technically fly, but it's not really flying. They're using the stormlight as pushing and pulling, and it's called lashing. Um, and that's yeah. in the in the first the uh, second prologue. One of the the, the character Zeth. Um, is using that magic, the lashing magic, and yeah, but it's not explained. Along, that what he can run along the because lashing, you you basically with lashing is you change your gravitational pull direction, so you can you can lash yourself uh, upwards to an object, and then up becomes down, and you're running on the ceiling. But to you, it's upside. Everything else is upside down. The way you, then the that's way you how that experience book it. Out. That's why you're like you gotta pay attention. But you can also like lash things like you can lash a like for instance, he lashes a piece of wall to the sky, and it sends the thing flying. Um, but it's all like it's not explained, and you're like, what the hell is this? And so I've always that what you're describing to me right there sounds a whole lot like the 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 doctor strange movie when they were running up the buildings and stuff yeah and mm -hmm. i've always been of the opinion that fantasy has to especially urban fantasy has to be very careful because it comes it bumps up so closely to the superhero genre right i was going to mention that earlier mm -hmm. and i'm wondering do you think that that is possible in a high fantasy setting like storm or what whichever one you're talking about there, you could definitely that, that read pretty super heroic to me you could definitely read um that in the way of in all the novels actually and actually a lot of the um he does really good fight uh scenes and a lot of like he does the superhero landing like where you land on your knee and your arms back out there. Um, mm -hmm. And he does a, a ring of dust uh, expanded around him when he slams down the rocks crack. Yeah. It, and he does like a lot of those epic things in your mind where you're like, oh, that's legit. Um, have, you ever, so, have you ever seen the thing where they, they show people running like, like they do in the manga comics with their arms back? And like how it doesn't make them go any faster when you're running like that? My kids do it all the time. They're always running around here with their arms shot back. The, yeah, the the not the yeah that yeah. Continue. What's funny is my my three year old does that, and I don't think that anybody taught him to do it. He just did it, and I was like, <laughs> "He's a ninja. He is a born." Let's see, James McCormick says, "Doesn't Josh's explanation of the magic seem sci-fi?" It is. I mean, it, it you could read it as that. Um, and there are a lot of sci-fi elements in a lot of his a lot of his um series and even uh mistborn mistborn era one is high fantasy mistborn era two is like a uh it's not quite steampunk um but it's in like the um 1700s 1800s type of time setting um and then it mistborn era three is going to be in in kind of a sci-fi futuristic setting did um, you guys read any steampunk i don't I know that i've ever read I'm trying to remember the the name of it. There was one. What, what was, was the girl? Uh, I I read one that was called the Wind Up Girl. Um, that, uh, but I never finished it. Yeah, uh, there's a steampunk, and the author's last name is Priest, like Samantha. 
Uh, oh, uh, the cherry, 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 cherry. Yeah. Something like that. I read one that I remember. It was called the Curious Case of Green yeah. Hill Jack. Bone Shaker. Yeah, Bone Shaker. That's supposed to be a classic. I've never read it. Uh, and that was Cherry Priest, I believe. But uh, it was okay. It was kind of cool. You know, this the whole kind of uh, 1800s, you know, because you've got all the formalities and the, the style of it and all that. But then you throw in that fantastic element and... I mean, it, but it's kind what of. What's it called? It's kind of the, the the one I read was called the I believe it was awesome. the Curious Case of Spring Hill Jack, and it's based on an English uh, folklore, urban legendy kind of thing, I believe. But um, but yeah, it was kind of cool. But it's kind of the same thing, you know. There's the fantastic element that butts up against the sci-fi element. You know, because yeah. it's, the, it's the whole steam era. So everybody's playing with electricity and all these different things. And then they kind of take that and explode it out a little bit. Oh, it's Sherry, like one, Sherry Priest, Bone Sherry. Sherry Priest. Yeah, Sherry. Bone Shaker is supposed to be a classic of the genre, but I've never read it. One, one we really should talk about sometime, and I'm trying to get the name of it. It was is basically was steampunk, but it was set in Japan. Ooh. Which I'm talking about. And it oh. was, I'm looking for it now. So I it might be the wind up girl that she's talking about, but it was Bangkok, and uh, I I got a little bit into it, and I I I I don't even I couldn't tell you why I didn't read it. It's uh, set in the future, and there's something about calorie wars and other things like that. I I have to go back and look at it. Have y'all read any more Weird West since uh, Make Me No Grave came out? No, actually, that's the only Weird West book I've ever read, and I thought it was fantastic. <laughs> To write some of that for a while. Apparently, it doesn't sell real well, but I don't know. It yeah. just seems like it'd be a fun sandbox to play in. Um, it's like that, and it kind of had um, what's that uh television series from back in the day? Um, with the railroad, and uh, it was on HBO. What was it called? Now I can't remember. I'll think of it. But oh, I, 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 I can't remember it. Sorry. What 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 was what was it again? Oh On HBO? gosh, HBO Western. Let's see, what Westworld. is it called? No, it's not Westworld. Westworld's Westworld got dumb. Deadwood. Oh, Deadwood. Dead, yeah, that's one of the best westerns ever made, in my opinion. Yeah, that should Deadwood, but with magic. Yeah, Deadwood with magic. That would be fun to write, in my opinion. You guys were talking about um, Mr. Mercedes earlier in our uh, group chat, and um, I started reading that book, and uh, definitely you could tell it was Stephen King, like just the way that he writes. Well, that's true for all his stuff, though. He has such a distinctive voice. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Yeah. Dang Those it. books, I, I like, I read all three of them, and, uh, and then I watched the. They actually did a TV show based off of them that was me. Eh. But uh, the first one I thought was really good, and mostly for the villain. I yeah. mean, I like I like the detective, but the villain was just. I mean, just so basically sinister. There was just something about him. He was just very intriguing, and the supporting character. One of the supporting characters in particular. Uh, I can't think of the name right now, but it's the the girl that ends up helping the detective. She was very intriguing. And uh, those, the first two of those are really good. The third one starts getting more into the Stephen King's, you know, horror fantasy type stuff. It's still good, but it's a little on the weird, weirder side. But if I was to point uh, anybody to a, a, uh, to a uh, Stephen King book recently would be The Outsider. Uh, I think that's yeah. the best put out in a while. So I watched that on HBO, the series when it came out, and uh, <laughs> I didn't. I figured it was going to go in the direction that it did, um, but I, I almost wish that it hadn't. Um, and had and just I, and I can't even explain what direction I wish it would have gone. Um, but the um, the acting was phenomenal. Holly Gibney, James McCormick says Holly Gibney. That that character in that story was awesome. 
Yes, Holly Gibney. That's the one. I really liked her character. I think that's one of the best characters King's ever come up with. Oh, she was great, great, and even and even even on screen, she was just really, really um, unique and troubled, and you could tell that. Uh, oh my God, just so good, like so good. But yeah, I, I like The Outsider a lot, and uh, there was another one called The Institute that was okay. It was pretty good. It got it got it was more on the lines of what was that when he wrote all those years ago, uh, Firestarter. You know, it's the whole everybody's all the kids have mental powers kind of things. And that was oh, kind yeah. of. Yeah. Um, I just I, sorry, I keep getting distracted. I really want to find this. So I want to get, you know, get your guys thoughts on it. If I can't find it, I want to bring it back to you later. You're talking about Search. a steampunk book you're looking for? It's a Japanese steampunk book. And I remember I, I got sucked into it years ago. And because of the cover was so awesome. And I read four or five of them and it was just really, cause there was like, it was, it had like, it was like Japanese being steampunk. It was very much a, a Japanese type of world building, but there was also some steampunk and some post-apocalyptic because there was like this ash thing and everybody had to wear filters. And so you couldn't hardly take your mask off. Yeah. And, and it was just, it's really awesome. So that was one that was one of the few times where there was like a, a, a genre mashup that I thought was amazingly well done. And then the other one I really like is Her Majesty's Dragons. And that's different. That's a mashup of fantasy and historical fiction. And that is uh, by Naomi Novik, Her, Her Majesty's Dragons. And it was fantastic. And it's basically Master and Commander with dragons. Nice. Um, it was really fun. I ripped through those. And then I got to the end and she hadn't finished the series. And then I got distracted. And now, now there's probably four or five more books I have read. And that, one, that one was excellent as well. You know, it's a, a book that I read um, here recently that I was not expecting to like as much as I did was The 13 Lives of Harry August. I think that's what it called. Or the first, maybe it's The First 13 Lives of Harry August or something. Um, and it, basically it's about a, a man who, when he dies, starts over um back basically back in the womb and is born again and then but he retains all the memories from his previous life holy crap uh, um <laughs> and no and no matter how he dies he always ends up back at where he was uh where where he's born and um it was very um i can't even remember how it ended but i remember being really like sucked in because there there goes like it's it's funny i have a like a training montage and like some movies where they're like now we have to get good and so he trains and but it's basically like a dying montage like at, at one point of the book where he's like like jumping off of buildings and killing himself and like doing a whole bunch just trying to break the cycle of of being born again and it, it like it's it he goes through i don't know like I don't know how many deaths, but it's it's it was pretty cool. Uh, that was a really good book that that I was not I anticipating. Was like, Day. <laughs> do what? Oh yeah, oh, Groundhog Day. Yep. Ultimate Groundhog Day. It's not just that day; it's your whole life. It's your whole life. Yeah. Over and over again. That's pretty smart. <laughs> yeah, that was really well done too. Uh, I was I was really conflicted and and kind of uh and, and really wondering where she was going to take the book. I think it was a she, um, but. Uh, Really well done. Anyway, uh, we've talked and rambled for an hour, and um, I, you know, I'd really much like to just bullshit like this every episode if we could. I'd be cool yeah, with that. I'm cool with it, especially if we're talking about fantasy. That's kind of my wheelhouse. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm I'm listening to more and more fantasy, and and absolutely love the. Um, I think we should do airships next next week so we could talk about I could find this this Japanese one I talk where they have kind of dirigible airships and stuff. We could talk about hell divers, which has far oh, future yeah. far future nuclear powered airships. We could talk about several different things like that. So, Butcher, uh Jim Butcher wrote a I think the first yes, book, uh, this windless. I don't know. Their aeronauts windless. I have the hardback. Yeah, I have a super them. good, super, super good. Bad. Yes, it's very good and. Uh, I it's it's obviously not complete. It's supposed to be a series, but I have no idea when he's going to write it. Um, right. The coolest thing about that series is his cats. He has talking cats in the series, and they're the most sarcastic characters 
um that and they're they're great it's just a really fun um book man and that's uh it's not complete so i don't know how if you want to start it or not but that's a fantasy that's not it's not grim dark um and there's a cool like mysterious thing about the world because they all live in these uh they're called cinder spires mm -hmm. but they all live in these spires because they can't go down to the surface because the, the surface is like covered in uh like deadly animals and they can't go down there but it's you you're you're meant to believe that it's like some type of earth type planet that was not like that thousands of years ago like they they came from the surface and like the whatever happened was a mystery but that was a good book too yeah cool uh so we're trying to get karen travis on the show i don't know when that's going to happen we're in talks to get her yeah. on so hopefully that'll happen pretty soon uh we'll see maybe next week we'll get devin on the show um and uh it's it's uh, been a relaxing summer and so bear with us this summer uh scott's going to a new uh bat channel and new bat time so we're going to try to figure out what is the best time for him to do the show a night person that's right and uh and and i'm still trying to figure out this whole lake deal and and um, not be exhausted when i'm done so um if we're, we bounce around schedule wise and time wise bear with us while we figure it out um we're still going to have a show we just need to figure out the best time to to do it live so jerry maggard's coming on thursday is that correct on thursday night live i uh, i don't know He's going on. The oh yeah, there we go. My, my my chat was slow. Yeah. Yes, looks like Terry Maggart's going to be on Thursday nights on the on the uh, the writer's journey, and then of course tomorrow morning you'll have Walt Robillard doing coffee and concepts. So you don't want to miss that. Um, so yeah, good times, everybody. Thank you all for coming and hanging out with us in the live show. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. We're on our way to a thousand subscribers this year, and we're super close. I think we're within thirty. We're within 30 so if you have a friend uh that that likes writing or just that you have a friend with a youtube account that you want to say hey go like these guys that's cool too uh and uh and go and, and subscribe we hit a thousand that's our goal for this year i think we're gonna make it so i'll be happy uh thank you guys for coming and hanging out with us everybody in the live chat i hope you have a great morning also everybody in the listening in the live feed i hope you have a great week come and see us live and until next time i am josh hayes here with chuck manley and scott moon we always talk about writing, we always talk about reading, and sometimes we talk about everything in between. Right here on Keystroke Medium. Peace. Later. Still live.